Hello, my name is Glenn Hall and today is March 29th, 2021. Today is the fifth in my series uh, called Passover, Not Easter. And um, the subtitle of this one is Many Are Called, But Few Are Chosen. And this is going to be probably the hardest one for you to deal with uh, up to this point. So I just want to ask you to prayerfully consider what I say in this, and I pray that God will open the eyes and the ears of those who are to hear this message. The reason why it's important to understand that Passover relates to the firstborn instead of all people at the present time is because the entire scripture was written for the chosen overcomers or the chosen Kodeshim, not for the whole world. Jesus spoke in parables for this reason. The reason was to hide the truth from the general masses of humanity. He spoke in, par in parables to hide the truth, not to explain the truth. Almost every preacher that I've ever heard discuss parables say that Jesus spoke in parables in order to tell a story to make the truth of the gospel easier for them to understand. Exactly wrong. Jesus spoke in parables to hide the truth. And I'm going to prove that uh, very clearly. Matthew, we're going to read from Matthew now, Matthew now chapter uh, 13, verses 10 through 17. <clears throat> then the disciples came and said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus answered them, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables. Because seeing, they do not see. And hearing, they do not hear. Nor do they understand. I'm going to continue reading, but I want to explain this a little bit. I speak in parables because I give them something they think they see, but they do not see. They think they hear, they know they hear, they heard words, they heard me talk, but they do not hear. Then he says, nor do they understand. They saw Jesus, they heard Jesus, they understood the story, but they didn't understand the spiritual meaning of the story. That's what he means, nor do they understand. <clears throat> Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled. That says, and here now Jesus quotes Isaiah. You will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can barely hear. And their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn, and then I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people longed to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. Again, that's Matthew 13, verses 10 to 17. Later in the same chapter, Matthew said this. You must understand this. Chapter, uh, chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. He said nothing to them without a parable. Now, remember, Jesus is the Word of God. As Jesus inspired men of old, 
as Jesus inspired the prophets, as he inspired Moses to write the Torah, as he inspired Isaiah, as he inspired all the writers of the books of the Bible, he spoke the word of God through them. When Jesus was here and he addressed the people, he only spoke in a parable. As Jesus gave his word to his prophets, he always gave them parables. The entire Bible is written in parables. Yes, the stories are historically correct. Nevertheless, They are parables, so they tell spiritual and prophetic truth. So when you read the Bible, and this is why it is so very important that you read the Bible and you don't depend upon men to teach you. Always be praying, Lord, show me what you're saying here. Reveal to me what you're saying here. Just today, In fact, um, it's my habit to read some of the Bible every morning. And um, I've been reading Isaiah a lot lately. And I had a thought. Why doesn't Isaiah ever talk about Passover? Immediately, in my spirit, I received Isaiah always talks about redemption and about the Redeemer. And Passover is all about redemption. It's all about the Redeemer, the blood of Jesus, the blood of the Lamb that redeems us. And so I went to several verses, and I'll probably teach those later, but not today. So reading again from Matthew 13, Verse 34, all all these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden from the foundation of the world. The question we face now is, why does God make this so hard? Well, we have to turn back to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah 6 was the chapter that Jesus quoted above. So let's go to that chapter. and We're going to read the, the entire chapter. Isaiah 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me! For I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. So this is the redemption of the Lamb of God. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, So the Lord now says this to Isaiah. Isaiah volunteers to go to the people. Isaiah volunteers to go preach the word of God. That's what he's volunteering to do. How many of us have done that? So he said, Go and say to this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. 
Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, and their ears heavy, and blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. This prophecy of Isaiah even makes it clear that for some reason this is God's intent for this time. Then I said, so Isaiah says, it's like, I can't believe what I'm hearing, but he says, how long, Lord? And he said, the Lord said, until cities lie waste without inhabitant and houses without people and the land is a desolate waste and the Lord removes people far away and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. And though a tenth remain in it, it will be burned again like a terebinth or an oak whose stump remains when it is chopped down, when it is felled. And then he says, the holy seed is its stump. That's Isaiah 6. So this chapter begins with God revealing himself to the prophet Isaiah. Immediately upon receiving that revelation, Isaiah mourns over his sinful condition and he realizes that he is poor in spirit. So poor in fact that he even calls his own lips unclean. Are you poor in spirit? I am poor in spirit. I am I am so poor in spirit that I can barely stand my position. I mourn over my poorness in spirit. Isaiah did the same thing. And by responding in this way, Isaiah shows that he, at that time, qualified to begin walking as an overcomer. I think that that is really the most basic qualification for an overcomer, for a Kodashim, for someone who has a chance to become um, one of the first fruits, for one who has a chance of becoming a son, a real, true son of God, that he mourns over his poor spiritual condition. In response to his heart's cry, without guile, he had he was without guile. God then sends a seraphim to touch his lips with a live hot coal. This represents it is a type of the baptism of fire, the roasting of the lamb that every overcomer must go through. At this point, Isaiah qualifies for the ministry of the word of God. God asks who will go to preach for Elohim, and Isaiah volunteers. Then God God gives him his marching orders. Isaiah will indeed preach the word of God. It is sweet in his mouth, but its outworking will be bitter represented by the eating of the bitter herbs. Bitter because no one will understand him. Then Isaiah wonders, how long will this go on? How long will it be until people will finally begin to understand your word? God answers that this will not occur until judgments come. until judgments come. My wife and I have often considered, why is it that God has allowed things to get this bad? If you have bothered, if you've taken the time to look at sources of information besides the mainstream media, you will see that over the four years of Donald Trump, God revealed incredible 
evil going on in this world. Incredible evil dealing with child sex trafficking, ritual satanic abuse, ritual satanic sacrifice, drinking of adrenochrome. And look that up if you don't know what it is. Adrenochrome. Um, beyond sick, beyond, beyond imagination, really. It was, I learned things in the last four years that um, I had no idea of. And <clears throat> there's prophecies that men will loathe themselves for the evil that they have done. When you begin to realize the evil that has been done and is being done in this world, then you will loathe yourself for some of the sins that you still partake of. And that's the purpose, we think, for why God has allowed it to go this far. God has, God has allowed things to get to the point where men see what sin really is, that men really see how lawless and sinful they are. The man of lawlessness has been revealed. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Therefore, the second coming of Christ can come. The Episanugogi, the doctrine of the coming of Jesus Christ, is at hand. Jesus' coming is at hand. But how will it look? I'm going to remind us again. Isaiah wonders, how long will this go on? How long will it be until people will finally begin to understand your word? God answers that this will not occur until judgments come and until the holy seed, that is the firstborn, the first fruits, the overcomers, are a mere stump in the land. All that is left of that huge tree today which sees itself as the kingdom of God on earth, the church. Now I'm going to apply the doctrine of Passover, the 14 doctrines of Passover that are hidden in the scripture. The overcomers will have been the only ones who, number one, applied the blood of the Passover lamb to the doors and lintel of their lives. They applied the blood of Christ to their souls. They drank his blood. They ate his flesh. They applied the blood to their lives, to their souls. Number two, who ate the lamb, who ate the flesh of Christ with unleavened bread, representing, representing a soul without guile and hypocrisy, which has embraced the true doctrine of Christ. Paul says that we must Partake of the Passover lamb, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Number three, the Kodeshim are the only ones who ate the lamb with bitter herbs. They submitted to living in the wilderness. They submitted to a life of travail and bitterness of soul as they worked out their soul's salvation 
in fear and trembling. Number four, they are the only ones who ate the lamb roasted in the fire, not boiled in water or eaten raw. The Kodashim submitted to the baptism of fire, allowing God's word to burn the dross, the sin, out of their souls. Number five, the Kodashim are the only ones who roasted and ate the lamb whole, with its head, legs, and inner parts. They did not pick and choose the words of God that they would apply to their lives. To them, the word of God is as a seamless garment which conveys one truth, God's truth, and one law, and all of it is to be eaten. Number six, the Kodashim are the only ones who ate the lamb without breaking its bones. What does this mean? Of course, the people of Israel did not pick up the whole lamb and pass it around to each person to take a bite of it. They cut the joints and marrow with a sharp knife. This represents the truth of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The Kodashim understand the difference between soul and spirit. Overcomers learn to discern the word of God and they submit to the Spirit's work in them. They understand that the word seeks to convert their souls, not just bring their spirits a one-time salvation that does not affect their earthly life. The Kodashim know that Jesus died for them. The Kodashim know that they cannot lose that salvation. But there is a salvation that they can forfeit, like Esau forfeit his birthright. That's why they work out their salvation in fear and trembling. So they don't break the bones of the lamb. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Seventh, the Kodashim ate all the lamb in one night. They consumed Christ's flesh and blood during their one lifetime. That is, they assimilated his word into their very souls and made it a part of them during their earthly life, thus becoming one flesh with Christ, since they attempted to eat all of Christ, what remains of him that was not eaten, that is, that was not understood or assimilated during their lives, that will be burned in the fire. It will be imputed to them by faith at their judgment just before their glorification. Eight, the Kodashim ate the Passover lamb. They ate the body and blood of Christ with their loins girded. Read chapter, read Ephesians chapter six, verses 10 through 18, the armor of God. Part of the armor is that you gird yourself with a belt of truth. 
The Kodeshim have girded their loins with the truth of Christ. Their most vulnerable area in their body is protected by the truth of Christ. And number nine, they are the ones who ate the lamb with their feet shod with the gospel of peace. That again is part of the armor of God in Ephesians 6. Tenth, the Kodeshim are the ones who ate the lamb with his staff in his hand. The staff or the rod represents the blossoming almond tree rod of Jeremiah 1.11. It also represents the uh, Aaron's rod that budded that was put into the Ark of the Covenant. This speaks of new life, resurrected life, which will be first displayed in each overcomer, each firstborn man-child, and the first fruits of God. So out of death, a dead rod will come life, new life. Number 11, the overcomers are those who ate the lamb in haste. Now this is some mystery that I don't really understand, but the obedience of the over overcomes overcomers somehow seems to hasten the coming of the day of the Lord. I'm going to read 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8-13. through 13. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar. And the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's 2 Peter 3, verses 8 through 13. Twelfth, the overcomers are those who became circumcised by faith in Christ. I'm going to read... Uh, Colossians 2, verses 9 through 15. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised, with the circumcision made without hands, and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through faith in the operation of God, who has raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing them, triumphing over them. So the overcomers have consented to the circumcision of their heart, have repented of a hard heart, and now have a heart of flesh that our God can easily mold and circumcise, cut off the evilness that's in our hearts and conform us to his image. Thirteenth, the overcomers are those who came out of Babylon. Now, I recently did a very lengthy 
series of videos on the mystery of the beast, and I discuss Babylon a great deal. And the sad fact of the matter is that a, a very large portion of the church still remains in Babylon, still partaking of the sins of Babylon, therefore partaking of her plagues and of her judgments. The Kodeshim came out of Babylon. They came out of the ways of the world. They came out of the satanic kingdom and refused to eat the Passover lamb with uncircumcised foreigners. This means that the overcomers did not fellowship in Christ with those who refused to acknowledge, accept, and consume Christ in faith as they did. This is why a lot of the overcomers are not, you don't find them in the church. You don't find them in the established churches. The overcomers have come out of Babylon. Today's church says, everyone welcome. Well, was Ananias and Sapphira welcome? What happened to them when they came to the church with um, lies in their heart? They drop dead. People who refuse to repent should not be in the church. You don't allow, Paul says, judge the evil one among you that's in the church. I'm not at all saying to judge the world because then you would have to leave the world. But the church doesn't even judge within its own walls because they don't judge evil. They don't, they don't call evil, evil. The church, like the world, accepts evil. And by default, they call evil good and good evil, which is an incredible sin. In fact, it's, it's the unforgivable sin. It's blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is what it is. And finally, number 14, the Kodeshim are those who ate the lamb in one house, God's house, as a firstborn son of God. And here I want to read Hebrews 3, verses 1 through 6. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. The Kodeshim eat the lamb in one house, the house of God, and the Kodeshim do not deny the lamb. There are, there are many New Age teachers out today who are talking about walking in a higher vibration. And they're exposing evil, and they're, I think that they're doing a good work with respect to that. Most of them believe in uh, reincarnation. Uh, I still am um, uncertain about that. I think it's, it's a possibility because we were foreknown. We were known before the foundation of the world, the scripture says. And how long did it take 
for God to prepare an overcomer? How long did it take for God to prepare a Kodeshim? How long did it take for God to prepare someone who would be conformed to his image? I don't know the answer to that. But all of these new age teachers who are talking about a higher vibration and moving into the fifth dimension out of this third dimension that we live in, they will speak of a, a source. They might speak of a creator, you know, they, or some other word. They might even use the word God. But very few will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is God and that Jesus Christ died for their sins. Most of them also are believing that they've done something special, that they're, they somehow are ascending through their own efforts and their own abilities. But Paul said this very clearly. When the Galatians wanted to get circumcised, they were Gentiles and, and uh, some uh, Jews or someone came through who believed that you had to be circumcised in order to be a, a true Christian. And Paul said, well, are you now going to be perfected in the flesh by what began in the spirit? I've heard one of these new age teachers who has had some really good videos say that there's not just going to there's there's just not going to be a, a one time event where suddenly you you can only do good you just have to keep doing good you're always going to have the uh, ability to fall i think that's wrong i know that i have the ability to fall now I know that I live in the flesh. That's why I mourn over my sinful condition. But there is coming a time when my flesh will be glorified and I will be unable to sin. Do you think Jesus could sin? He was tempted, but without sin. Actually, Jesus being fully man at that time, he could have sinned, I think, because he was not yet glorified. But he didn't sin. He, he was perfect. He was God. And he came and he showed. And that's why, he, that's why his blood can atone for us. But you and I are not perfect. You can still be tempted. I can still be tempted. I know this very well. And so, therefore, I depend upon Jesus constantly to keep me pure before him. But there's going to come a day when this flesh will be glorified. And when that happens, I will not be able to sin. Really, if you think about it, doesn't that make sense? If God's going to have a kingdom that is really a godly kingdom, really a great kingdom, then he needs people who are like him, who aren't going to screw it up, who aren't going to blow the whole thing out of the water. Yes, many are called, but few, very few are chosen. For the vast majority of those called, many are called. And for those called, for most of them, the word of God spoken to Isaiah and quoted by Christ has proved true. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy, and blind their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. I didn't say that. The Lord said it through Isaiah. And then 
Paul says in Romans 9, verse 19, you will say to me then, why does God still find fault? For who can resist his will? For who are you, O man? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory, even us whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. I want to say something here that that is a a very deeply hidden mystery that um, concerning the people that God makes, including Satan, I could not have learned righteousness unless I had seen evil. In one of Isaiah's verses, the Lord says, I, the Lord, create evil. The reason why God did this was because men had to know what evil was in order for them to want to choose the good. And for those, it it is the Kodeshim, it's the first fruits who first decided that all they wanted was good. They learned to discern good and evil, and they have chosen good. And they want to be only good. That's the purpose that God for why God created evil people, including Satan. It was in order to train his sons and his daughters to be like him. So, we see that Passover with its many regulations prophesies of the firstborn, firstfruits man-child, the only ones in the present age who would in some measure even though that is a small measure for most of us, work out Passover's principles in their lives. I know there was a lot in this. Uh, It'd be worth listening to again so that you can get it all, take notes. And I pray that God will open your eyes to his truth.